All right, we're back. We're ready to rock and roll. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Good to see all of your happy, beautiful, smiling faces this fine Saturday morning. We're back home, back in the office, back with the regular setup, all of the... uh, all of the the kit and the gear and the cameras and the lights and and everything back from uh, back from that trip down south. So, well, my friends, I've missed you. For those of you who managed to make the new time in the last few weeks, uh, that's awesome. It was great meeting so many new people. For all of my regulars who have been here day in and day out for months on end, I'm looking forward to seeing you all again here back at this regularly scheduled time of. I don't even know what time it is now. 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 11 a.m. Eastern. Let's go with that. I think it's uh, I think it's time to dive in. So with that said, let me know in the comments, can you hear me? That's step one. Make sure that our tech is all good here. And then step two is we'll dive into some questions. Always a bit of a lag here. Oh, there we go. We've got some stuff. We've got some stuff. It's funny. Anytime I use this software, uh, instead of streaming directly through YouTube, there's always like this tiny bit of a lag that we've got to account for. But it looks like some of the questions are coming in and some of my some of my friends are here. Corporal Diesel, good morning from Central Texas. Good morning, Corporal Diesel. So good to see you and you can hear me fine. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's always good to get those... Um, those confirmations because sure enough, there'll be, there'll be someone here who's like, I can't hear you. And then I always wonder if it's me, is it their speakers? What's happening? So let's see. We've got eat French fries. I could not agree more. Delicious. Quasi nutritious, perhaps. Uh, good morning from New York. Hear me loud and clear. Perfect. Amazing. I'm going to try and move this off center. My mic, my camera has a bad habit of like focusing in on my microphone and then blurring my face out, which, which may or not be good. Uh, let's see, Jeff, you've got some good questions. Here we go. First, our obligatory greetings. We've got to say hi. Bonjour. Bonjour, Jeff. Comment ça va? Dominican, are you still in the Dominican right now or are you back home? And if so, is the Dominican Republic like Haiti where they speak French as well? Or is it like, my gut says Spanish still. I think it's Spanish. Uh, anyway, happy Saturday. Welcome back to the regular hours. Hope you had a great time with the family. As always, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Yes, it was a good time. Thank you very much, but also amazing to be back. Uh, Latricia, I'm sorry to hear about your aunt. Aunt. We say aunt in Canada. Aunt, also acceptable. Regardless, my, uh, my deepest condolences for your loss. Yes, spend time with the family. Thank you for checking in and saying hi. Um, and that way everybody can wish you all the best as well as you go through these difficult times. Never fun. Never fun. Uh, okay. So let's see. Shall we dive right in? I think we should. We got a good hour. Caffeinated, hydrated, well-fed and ready to rock. So Ludwig asks, what strategies did you implement to manage client expectations effectively and maintain strong relationships with them even when faced with unforeseen challenges or Setbacks. Ooh, excellent question. So let me see. What strategies did you use for client expectations and strong relationships, especially when challenges happen? Okay. So before we get that, first of all, 23 people here so far, we're going to see that number grow. But for now, we've got five thumbs up. Let's hit, uh, let's hit more thumbs up. Then it'll help more people see the thing. So hit the little likey button. That's the technical term. All right. So how do you manage client expectations? Uh, Number one is the fact that you're asking that question is proof that you're, you're setting off on the right foot already. Like that really is the secret is to just be aware of whatever engagement you're getting into, understanding that you're going to try to manage client expectations right from the very beginning. So the best thing that you can do is communicate and err on the side of over communication, especially in the beginning. So anytime you sign a new client, a new customer, they always have that brief moment of buyer's remorse. The worst thing you can do is collect someone's payment information and then disappear and don't talk to them for one day, two days, a week, whatever it is. Like that just sets in all of the wrong feelings. So right away, let them know, here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what you can expect from us, et cetera, et cetera. You set the tone, you set the frame for what they're going to be expecting. So it's up to you. You're the expert in this sphere, in this sphere. Now, what do you do when things go wrong? Because believe it or not, things will go wrong. Um, Not for everyone, not all the time, but for some people, some of the time, they will go wrong. Now, when it comes to marketing uh, and like say running an advertising agency, 
there is literally going to be like, you cannot have a 100% perfect track record. Even me. Oh, I wish I did. But like, there are times when the product, the offer, the, the ad campaign, like something just doesn't click. What I like to do is I have a money back guarantee essentially. So I will factor that in with my clients. Now, number one, I will try to do everything that I can to make things right. So I will work my tail off. I will bring in contractors and consultants and anyone else I can find to solve the problem. For example, let's say we just can't get the cost per lead that a client is looking for. But barring that, I'll give them their money back. I'll say, hey, here's everything that I did. Here's everything. Like, this is why it should work. This and this and this. I failed to deliver the results that we talked about. So here's your money and send them on their way. That honestly, that's, uh, that's been my strategy. I have not had to do that many times, but when I have, and when I felt better about it, uh, the client was always happy. Everyone was happy. I maintained my reputation. Good things. All good things. All right, Jeff, a couple questions. One of two, Adam, remember my business name is Atomic Web App and Services Inc. My services are web design, mobile dev, and branding. They are part of marketing. I real feel limited by the name and services. Yeah. So, it's funny. It's like, again, when you're thinking about a business name and you're thinking about who it's for, there's a couple things that, that sort of like, I don't want to say trigger me, but, but are going off as like red flags in my mind. So it's like, I don't mind the name atomic. That's fine. Web app. Do you do like, do people know what that is? Honestly, like some people will not know what that is. Like, is it website design? Is it website development? In which case I like the whole name, um, web app and services Inc like services, car washing, dog walking, like, so, so that it is pretty broad. Um, next part, marketing slowly became a passion. Now that you've simplified it, should I consider starting over with a personal brand? Uh, it can still feed the atomic web app with technical work. What do you think? Yeah. Good question. It really depends on how mature and, um, established your business is. If it's really well established and you've got a long list of clients and they know your name and they know everything that you do, um, then yeah, switching your brand name is obviously a little bit harder. It, that said, it's kind of, it's easier to probably switch it to a personal name. You just let them know they're going to be getting a slightly better, higher quality, um, more personalized service. So that's always an easy trade. <sighs> Again, it really depends on how many clients you have. And what you want to do with the business. Do you want to grow this under your personal name or do you want to grow it under a um, Atomic Web App brand moniker? My preference is almost, I don't want to say universally, but it's certainly a lot easier going with a personal name simply because people don't like doing business with businesses. They like doing business with people. Are you still going to be the face of this business anyway? In which case, I'd rather work with Jeff than Atomic Web App Services, which I may or may not understand. I hope that makes sense. We can talk about that more later. Oliver, morning from Montreal. Bonjour, mon ami. Comment ça va? No one plans to fail. David. Hello from the armpit with a new account and avatar. Oh, we got the answer. There we go. I was looking for that last week. I was like, hey, what is um, what is happening here? But yes, amazing. Good to see you, my friend. Glad you could make it. Patrick, missed you the last couple of weeks, my friend. Hey, and yo to you too. Fat guy in the kitchen. Now there's a name. There's that. I like the branding. <laughs> Good morning. I'm a marketer myself in Pennsylvania. It's so very refreshing watching your videos and seeing someone that truly understands the intricacies and nature of what marketing actually is. I appreciate that, my friend. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you're enjoying the videos. Uh, Jeff, now you're back in Miami. No, they only Spanish, but yes, I was born and raised in Haiti. Hey, well, there we go. Very cool. We're crossing our international borders. Uh, Habiba, good afternoon. Adam from London. Good afternoon, Habiba. I'll be in London. Oh, it's going to be a while now. Less than a year? Less than a year. I'll be back in London. Elon, hey, my friend. Good to see you. <coughs> Recorrecting last week's cue. Oh, perfect. Okay. When you create an ad, what does the ad itself look like? Do you describe the features? UGC, as in user generated content. What happens in the video ad? Okay. Good question. So when you're creating an ad, there's a couple things that you need to keep in mind. First of all, when we're talking about an ad, we're talking about advertisement, which means we're paying money to the platforms in order to show this. There's often very little difference between an organic social media post and a paid online social media advertisement, like say a Facebook post versus a Facebook ad, an Instagram post versus an Instagram ad. The difference is money. 
that's it. Not quite like boosting a post or promoting a post, which I am not a fan of, but like setting up a proper ad, you can use the same content, which is why I like creating a lot of social or why I advise creating a lot of social media content organically. You can then find the ones that perform best and turn them into ads, possibly with stronger calls to action. So what does the ad look like? Terrible answer, but it depends. Like it depends on the target market, the offer, the industry, the placement. Um, you mentioned there asking about a video ad. Well, I've got a script that I use for a video. I had a really rough template of starting with a call out, a strong hook, presenting the problem, um, advertising the solution to the problem, uh, ending with a call to action. That all happens within a span of 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, depending on the placement. So there really is no like, this is everything that we say every time. This is how it always works. It's always a trial and error, adjust, creative input, market feedback in order to find that mythical combination, what I call a super ad. Essentially putting out ads, getting feedback, putting out more ads, tweaking them again, putting out more ads and getting more and more feedback. The best thing you can do to find out what ads work is spend a lot of time upfront trying to build what you think are the few perfect ads, put them out there, see which ones get higher click-through rates, higher um, engagement lower cost per lead, etc., and then double down from there. Harsh, found your channel like a couple of weeks ago and you're amazing. Oh, Harsh, you're amazing. Thanks for being here. I'm glad you could make it here. Uh, Jeff, have I ever read The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber? Yes, I have. Many times, actually. Uh, thoughts? Any book recommendations for my situation? You know me well enough. Yeah, I'm getting to know you really well, Jeff. It's good. I, um, I've got quite a few books that I recommend. Let's talk about... Let's talk about the E-Myth first because it's a classic entrepreneurial book. There are things that I really like about it and then there's things that just don't resonate as well with me. That said, I like it more than I dislike it. So well, let me unpack that. Essentially, the E-Myth Revisited, for those not familiar, by Michael Gerber. It's worth reading. Like You should probably read it if you haven't already. And it essentially talks about the E-Myth being the entrepreneurial myth. Basically, people are really good at what they do. So they're like, I'm going to start a business. And then they end up becoming an employee of their business. They're not able to scale it. They're not able to grow it. They get trapped in it. And, and life just sucks, generally. Uh, the solution is you need to think more like a business owner, an operator, where you're going to put pieces in place. The business can run without you, so you can take time off and away. All of those things are valuable and important. For me personally, I like being an operator. So I'm, I'm kind of in the business every day because I like it. Um, that's it. That said, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who have grown very successful businesses uh, by removing themselves completely and the business can run by uh, without them. I have elements and I have actually different businesses like that that I own um, and have uh, equity in. So I've kind of got both bases covered, but for the my main core thing, I just like what I do. So I think it's good. The better question I think for you is we've got to look at what are your biggest problems right now and where are you running into obstacles and then we need to find the books and solutions that best present against those. So for you, the E-Myth is really good. If you're looking for one that I actually prefer, it's called Clockwork, C-L-O-C-K-W-O-R-K, Clockwork by Mike Michalowicz. I'm not going to spell his last name. Um, he's also got a number of other books as well, but Clockwork is really good. Um, also, the Actually, start with the pumpkin plan. Pumpkin plan is better. Pumpkin plan is like Mike McCallowitz's version of Seth Godin's Purple Cow. So I think both of those are good in regards to creating like something truly remarkable. Start there. Uh, no one plans fail. David, your video this week was awesome. New, no, uh, new business failure rates are too high. I believe that too many new businesses do not plan properly in the beginning. Your opinion. I feel like we're on one of those, um, like a panel. It's like, present the thing. Adam, we pass it over to you. Uh, so yes, my opinion, uh, and I feel very strongly about this, is that most businesses fail for exactly the reason that you just said, David, which is that they don't plan things through. They don't think things through. And, and most importantly of all, they don't understand not only what marketing is, but the importance of marketing. So this is a bold statement, but I stand by it. Marketing is the single most important element to your business success, period full stop. Anybody that understands marketing strategy, some of the tactics, some hacks, some tips, some tricks, uh, their business will do fine. It's not the best business that wins. It's the business with the best marketing. 
I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it was like we could always count on the best business, just providing better service and uh, and providing a better product and genuinely caring and doing all those things. I wish that that was the answer. But this whole myth, uh, we call it like the field of dreams where build it and they will come. That ain't, that's not even close to true. Like build it and they're probably not going to come. They, they don't even know that you're there. Uh, they're certainly not going to tell anyone. So you're just going to suffer miserably and then go out of business crappy existence. We don't want that for anyone. So yeah, you need marketing, which means at the core root, like the core of marketing, what is your business model? What are your margins? What is your unique competitive advantage? How are you different from the competitors? How are you going to scale? Who is your target market? Why do they want to choose you? Like these are all deep, important questions. They're not easy to answer in, uh, in five minutes and they shouldn't be, but that's why people fail. They don't want to, they don't want to do the work. Ah, Elon, where can I find a first client? I'm willing to work for free, but I'm afraid that we will waste money on ads and not see something in return. Okay, so if you're talking about running ads for yourself, then yes, don't necessarily. Um, if you're talking about getting your first client for free, running ads for them, but not seeing something in return, yes, that is a very reasonable fear. Good for you for having that fear. You, you should. We should not be willing to go out there and spend a client's advertising dollars without... Um, with this fear that we're not going to be able to return them anything back. That said, if you're open and honest and upfront with a potential client and be like, Hey, here's the deal. I've been studying marketing. I've been studying all of these ads. This is a combination or a collection of the 50 best ads that I've found that I think we could make our version of for your business. This is the targeting that I think we should use. And you just break down everything. Would you like me to set all of this up for you as a test? I don't know. We'll spend 300 bucks, 500 bucks, hundred bucks, whatever it is, whatever you're comfortable with, Mr. Mrs. Business owner. And I will run them for you to try to get results. Honestly, that's, um, that's probably fine. Like, uh, you, you, if you go to say a small local business, target a local area, like they'll, they'll probably get something back. Uh, if you're targeting like a massive international audience using e-com ads or something like that, yeah, it's too competitive, but start with friends, family, colleagues, tell them everything that I've just said. And, um, I think you'll find someone that'll take you up on your offer in order to get those referrals testimonials. Jeff, follow up. What are your thoughts on personal brands, especially the risks of starting one? How can start the right way? Should I have a YouTube channel from the start? <coughs> Good question. My thoughts on personal brands are they are one of the single most valuable assets you can have as a human being. Um, I bought, like just to show you my belief in this, the day my, all of my kids, I got four kids, the day that each one of them was born, I bought their domain names, uh, .com. I don't know if .com is going to still be a thing in like 20 years, might be .ai, .net, maybe we won't have that, who knows. But I know the value of having a personal brand, so I bought their domain names. Uh, so that should go to show you just how important I think it is. What are the risks? It's your reputation. It's, um, you've got to guard it with your life. Like, but that's why I like personal brands because you've got skin in the game. You've got stake in yourself. Uh, people like people that stand behind what they do. And there's no better way to stand behind what you do than like literally putting your name on everything. So I like it. Um, how can you start the right way by making stuff? Honestly, that's it. Like I, I could tell you to outline your values and your ethics and outline your vision and your mission and your goals and, and all of that. Sure. You could do that. It's probably a good exercise, but like a better plan is to start making things that you care about and that you want associated with your personal brand. So let me rephrase that question. Actually, let me rephrase that answer. The best way to start a personal brand is to get clear on the topics that you want associated with your personal brand and then start creating content on those topics. For example, if I were to start a brand new personal brand today under say the banner of, um, of marketing, I would start to get clear on which are the pillars of marketing that I want to focus creating content on first and for what kind of audience. So say that I identify business owners as my primary market, then I figure, okay, well, I want to do social media content. I want to do just general content marketing, maybe email, maybe advertising. Let's, let's stick there. So these are the silos, the buckets that I'm then going to be creating content for with that target market in mind. And then I'm also going to try to identify the platforms that my market is active and present on and go there. Now, should you start a YouTube channel? If you have the mental fortitude, I know you do Jeff, but like if you, if you're committed to seeing this all the way through, then yes, it is. It is the best platform, um, for people to start building a personal brand on bar none, like, like just full stop. It is the best one. In fact, I've changed my opinion now or, or the advice I think is a better way to say it. 
in uh, even recently, what I was saying is the best opportunity in order to build your, your personal brand, your marketing in general, was short form vertical video content, YouTube shorts, TikTok, Instagram reels, Facebook reels, etc. That's still valid, but we're seeing outsized returns significantly now with YouTube long form content to the point that the effort, um, it's worth the effort for the rewards that you get. In the past, I just wanted people to take any action to get video done, so short form was fine, but now I'm gonna push you strong to long form video content. It's a journey, but you can put it together piece by piece. All right, fat guy in the kitchen. I gotta get your real name too. Uh, I don't mind that brand name though. It's, it's catchy and differentiated. Do I have any experience with Pinterest and using it for <coughs> shopping, t-shirts, etc.? Of course, getting conversions. Admittedly, it's a platform I don't use often, so I'm not positive the best strategy. Oh, good question. All right, so here's my, my views and opinions on Pinterest. Um, I do not have a lot of experience with it for the reason that my market is not predominantly on Pinterest. So I've never really taken the time to understand the nuances and the intricacies and the details of the platform. I've played around with it. So I've built pages, I've run campaigns, I've run ads. Uh, they're relatively new still, like the past, maybe it's two years now. It's been a while, but like they're not 10 year old uh, Pinterest ads. Uh, people not myself, but people that I know that were running a lot of Pinterest ads were doubling down on them and getting really good results from them. Still, it's not my, my preferred method. I think it's worth trying if you've identified that, say, your, your target market is predominantly female, you've got visually appealing content that you can make uh, promoted pins with, but I would almost rather you take that same kind of content, move it into like a TikTok style ad, an Instagram reel ad, a Facebook reel ad, um, and try there as well. So I'm not against it. Still not my favorite. Elon Bar, quick top seven books on marketing, self development, psychology, and money. Oh man, you're asking for these lists. Uh, I got a video on that. I think it's like top five marketing books. So check that one out. That will tell you. As if you want two more, I don't know. Ask in the ask in the comments. I'll see if I can come up with two more. But start with those. <coughs> Pardon me. Every time I go to Hawaii, fun fact, every time I go to Hawaii, doesn't matter how long for, a week, a month, whatever, I always get a cough. It's like I, um, I don't know, maybe it's the air conditioning and like the cars and uh, in the villa or whatever it is, but it's like I always get a cough and then hangs around for a while. So we're, we're going to battle through this together. What are your recommendations for managing multiple clients and projects simultaneously while maintaining deliverables and meeting deadlines? I've got, oh... I've got two recommendations for you on this one. The first of which is this for managing your actual campaigns and like where the clients and lead flow is inside your pipeline. So this is my preference for a CRM, um, not even CRM, like a marketing software essentially. Uh, the second one in regards to managing content flow is Notion, N-O-T-I-O-N dot S-O, I think, Notion. Um, it's my main project management tool that I use. So uh, basically between Notion and High Level, I'm kind of covered. Teacher Abel, I am doing marketing in Vietnam. The psychology is completely different. How do I understand the market psychology better? Oh, yes. Amazing. Good question. I love this because I do a lot of work uh, internationally with international audiences, international companies trying to breach into, um, break into other markets and things like that. Here's the secret, and it's not really a secret, it's just blood, sweat, and tears, manual labor, physical, mental labor. Uh, you've got to have conversations with the market. So you've got to find the ideal potential buyers, your ideal customer avatar, and you need to build out that profile similarly to what you would do in North America, in Europe, in South America, in Africa, wherever it is that you're going to be operating. You need to figure out pains, problems, fears, frustrations. You need to find out solutions, et cetera, et cetera. You also need to find native speakers that can help with the translations because sometimes things just don't get translated well and they come across weird or sketchy or aggressive or, or whatever it is. So you've got to make sure that that's working. Even if you're, even if your audience speaks English, and you're operating in English uh, instead of Vietnamese, you still need to make sure that the English words that you're using are well understood and they're similar, if that kind of makes sense. The second thing is you're going to need a decent quote unquote focus group of people to run this by. So when you create content, you want to show it to um, native Vietnamese people so they can look at it and be like, yes, I like that. No, I don't like that. 
here's why that's offensive. Here's why you should never say that. Here's why that's confusing, et cetera, et cetera. But that's it. The other thing you can do is start reading um, blogs, looking at videos for expats, people living in Vietnam that have moved from North America, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, because they're going to tell you a lot of the things about culture and differences, how to phrase things. Um, you've got some work ahead of you, but it's totally doable. 23 points a day. These days, are people responsive to QR codes in direct marketing and conference exhibit displays? Yeah, good question. Do people still use QR codes? So the answer is yes, people still use QR codes. In fact, I used one just a few days ago. I was standing outside of a, um, a shave ice place in Hawaii and I QR code the menu so I could go to the menu and we could make our selection while waiting in the insanely long line. But it's worth it. So good. Um, but yes, people still use them. The, the trick really is where you're putting them and then to watch the behavior and to track if they're still using them. So I don't mind putting them on products. I don't mind putting them on displays. I don't mind adding them as like a secondary option for people to get uh, additional information for. I don't typically like QR codes as a standalone feature simply because I know a lot of people that don't use them, don't really know how to use them, have never really cared. Um, so again, it's, it's going to depend on your market and, uh, and so on. But yeah, you can, you can use them. Teacher Abel, no one really uses them. Yeah, depends, right? Like it, it really does depend on your market and where you're putting them. Okay, let's see. Robert, good evening from Atlanta. Good evening, Robert. Good to see you. Akuna Soap Industry, am in charge of marketing and from Zambia. Very cool. Good stuff. Glad you could make it here. Ah, uh, Eng Zhao Tequera. Tequera, I think. My Portuguese is worse than my Spanish. Hello, Adam. Love your content from Portugal. How do you calculate the perfect timing between reminders, SMS, email, WhatsApp, after a lead has been created? <coughs> it's a great question, Zhao. Great question. So the question here is, how do you figure out the perfect timing for follow-up after somebody opts in? In other words, we've all been a part of this where we've opted in for, say, a lead magnet, and we get 15 SMS text messages and 74 emails and three push notifications, and we're just like, what is happening? Uh, we've also been a part of things where we opt in for something and we don't hear from anybody for a month. Then we get an email from them, and we're like, I don't, who, who are you? What are you doing in my inbox? And we unsubscribe, and we mark them as spam because we don't even know who this person is. So... There's a fine line. There's, a, there's this middle area. And what you're going to find is that it is very different depending on the, I call it rabidity. I'm not sure that's a word. Um, how rabid and hungry your market is. We should Google that. I'm going to Google it now. Rabidity. All these years I've been using it as a term. Oh, it might be a word. Rabidity. Unrestrained excitement or enthusiasm. Look at that. I learned something. It's a, a word I've been using that's actually a word. So if your market is just diehard passionate about a topic, you can send them a lot of stuff. Uh, like a lot of stuff. Um, three emails right away, two SMSs, like... Yeah, you can, you can follow up and it'll work. Um, I've been in markets where we've done this, especially around different er elements of health and fitness, um, disease prevention, uh, cancer, diabetes, things like that. Like people want that information and they want a lot of it and they want it now. So yeah, you can follow up a lot. Um, I've also been in markets where they don't want that much. Financial planning, investments, there's nothing that is super important where they're like, I do not need this volume of information right now, so then you need to space it out. So that should hopefully help. What I do recommend though is that you at least send that first contact point like immediately. Within five minutes, they're getting some kind of a message. If they've opted in for SMS, send it via SMS. If they're opting in for email, make sure you're sending it via email and then provide them next steps and let them know what's coming. By the way, over the next three days, we're going to send this. Over the next five days, we're going to be doing this. You can expect this from us, etc. Etc. All right. Black Girls Consult 2. Good to see you. Good morning. Love to hear your thoughts on marketing and ads for podcasts. I've heard two perspectives on this. Some say the podcast can be great for awareness ads. Others say it's not helpful. Ah, excellent question. Here's the deal. Marketing podcast ads work. Um, they work for more than just brand awareness. They work for lead gen, lead conversions. Um, they work if you're offering a freebie that guides people somewhere. 
What's important to understand about running podcast ads is the nature of the podcast itself. So it's typically, provided it's being read by the host, it has more authority, it has more trust, it often has more relevance because like with most, um, like all of the YouTube ads that I take on the channel, if we do a sponsored one or whatever it is, like I've vetted the company. I'm making sure that this is a company that I actually am willing to, um, to stand behind. I've used the product, I use the product or I believe in what they're doing. So podcasts are often the same way provided they're a more established podcast. So yes, I like them. Uh, also, a podcast audience is a high quality audience. They're typically spending 45 minutes to an hour with somebody listening to them uh, without being interrupted by other kinds of things. They might be doing other things, driving at the gym, laundry, whatever it is, but but they, they're pretty much tuned in. So yes, I like them, but again, it depends. It depends on the quality of the podcast. It depends on the quality of the audience. It depends on how many downloads they have. It depends on the quality of the ad. It depends on the placement of the ad. So when people say like podcast ads don't work, my my gut impulse is just like, well, then you have a crappy podcast ad. Um, you should just do better. Like, it, it, I don't know. It's like saying cardio doesn't work or fitness training doesn't work or whatever it is. Uh, teacher Abel, once or twice a week, I assume you mean for follow-up? I'm going to say that is wrong. Um, tough love, tough love moment. But but the reality is my answer stands. Like it could be once or twice a day for some audiences. Um, it could be once every two weeks for other audiences. Kevin, good morning. Oh, Kevin from Lakeland. Good morning, my friend. Good to see you here. Glad you could make it. Abdallah Hadam, I'm missing my sales targets. Any advice? Well, it depends on, are you missing your sales targets because of insufficient lead flow? Or are you missing your sales targets because the sales are not converting on the call? If you're missing it because of insufficient lead flow, we need more leads. If you're missing it because of um, just not having a well thought out sales process, conversation, et cetera, there's a lot of things we can do, including nurturing them, warming them up better ahead of time, letting them know what to expect, providing homework, and then just generally working on our sales. It's hard to offer advice on sales without knowing what your particular problem is because it's kind of like marketing. It's like, well, is your problem tone, framing, pacing, offer, etc.? A lot to go into it. Riyadh, I want to practice marketing, but I'm not sure where I can do that because I don't have a product. Any tips? I'll be so glad. Or you can make a video. You show us what to do and where. I like this question um, because how do you practice marketing, right? Like, what do you do? How, how do you go out there and start doing marketing when you have nothing to market? Well, first of all, you don't need to market a product. You can market a service. You don't even really need to market a service. You can market a message or an idea or a concept or a charity or whatever it is. So actually, let's do that note. If you can find like a charity to do marketing for, you could start there. If you have friends, family members, colleagues that they have businesses or they know people with businesses, you could offer your services there in order to help them create social media content, create uh, videos, things like that. That's probably the lowest place to start, the lowest hanging fruit, the best place to start would be some kind of content marketing through social media. Because then you're going to learn about content creation. You're going to learn about the platforms. You're going to learn about all the tools that they have available. A lot of stuff there. I don't think I have a video that shows you how to practice marketing. But I think that's it. Next thing you could do is start developing your personal brand. That's probably the best place to start marketing. Again, all the tips that I gave before uh, apply here. So when you're marketing your personal brand, build out your social media profiles create content for the social media profiles on the topics that you've identified as relevant to your personal brand, start posting, collecting feedback, growing an audience, engaging with other platforms, seeing what responses work, which ones don't, which ones get ignored, which ones the algorithm promotes. A lot of stuff you can do. All right, Jeff. Thanks, Adam. Uh, personal brand it is. I just wanted to point out in my notes for these lives, I actually have more than 2,000 words. Amazing. Good for you. My friend, uh, you are really having an impact and fixing lots of problems. Well, I appreciate that and good for you for taking notes. That's amazing. Good for you. That's um, that's how I learn anyways. It's like I need to take notes and I review my notes and I go back over it. So yeah, I like it and I like personal brands. Okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. Eng Zhao Tahira. I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation, but we're going to roll with it. Another question. How do you recommend to create content about a very technical service? So very boring to attract and retain audience. All right. I talked about this last week, maybe, or the week before. I want to talk about it again. How do you do marketing for a boring product or service? 
couple things. Number one, the product or service is not boring to the target market. We, we talked about this before where it was like selling electrical installation cables or something like that. Like to me and to possibly to you, that is boring. I'm going to ignore that ad. But to somebody that is involved in electrical installation and needs cables, like that's, that's their wheelhouse. That's what they do. You can't imagine the ads and the content that I see and I get all excited about and click on that my friends and my family would completely ignore as the most boring thing ever. In fact, I'm very aware of just how geeky I get about marketing so that when I'm in a public space with friends and family, I have to watch myself all the time so I don't just start rambling on about algorithms and consumer behavior and psychology because uh, people will be like, mm -hmm, that's, that's nice, Adam. That's, that's really good. And to me, it's the most fascinating thing in the world, but to them, they, they could honestly care less. They like me and so they, they, um, uh, they humor me once in a while and listen in. But like to people outside of marketing, marketing's boring. So everything's boring to other people. The second thing that you can do is really take the opposite swing. So there's going to be people that you're going to be able to attract with technical specifications and features and all of the intricate details of whatever it is you're selling, or you could just make it really funny. The example I like to give here is the insurance industry. If you look at advertising, marketing from companies like Aflac with their duck, um, State Farm, progressive insurance, like all of these industries have taken a humorous approach to what is possibly the most boring industry in the world, which is insurance. Because insurance, you're selling something that like, that's that's future Adam's problem. We'll let him deal with that. Like, I don't, I'm not even gonna benefit from it today. It's selling something that I don't get to see or feel or hold. It's just like, a, a oh man, like literally probably the hardest thing to market, insurance. Um, it's like vitamins. Nobody really needs it or knows they need it until you do. And then, boy, are you ever glad you have it. So, let's do that. Hannah, good to see you. Don't forget the thumbs up. Oh, you know it. Let's hit that thumbs up. I used to have this um, this graphic where like all these thumbs up things would fall down from the screen. But let's uh, let's do that now. And I'll, I'll sip water and we'll keep rolling. <clears throat> all right. Magda, excellent, excellent point. I talked about this right at the beginning. I think this is a response to that where I said, it's not the best business that wins, it's the business with the best marketing. True, but service or product must be great as best marketing strategy won't help the product or service if it's not great. Yes, let me, let me expand on this one though. You can sell a terrible product or service once with good marketing. You cannot build a sustainable business and sell multiple and have referrals and testimonials and things like that. Like it's that old expression, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Is that the one? Um, it's like you can sell a, a bad something with good marketing. You shouldn't, obviously, ethical, moral, business, financial reasons, like don't do that. Make sure your stuff is really good. But I like to, I like to consider that a given. Most people, I like to, maybe I should talk about this more. I like to assume that the product or service that you have is the best. It's really, really good and you're doing everything you can to make it the best that it is and there's nothing that you could you can think of to improve it. Like you're always working to make it better. And th In which case, then we just need to add more marketing to it. If you have something you don't believe in, yeah, stop selling it. Move on. Good point, Magda. I like that. Ludwig, some copy and messaging can sound really good in English, but when translated to Swedish, it sounds weird. What are your thoughts on this? I think you're, you're exactly right. Yeah, 100%. Um, I'm experiencing the same thing when I'm learning um, uh, Spanish. There's a word. I won't say it now because it's um, uh, very offensive. I'm sure people will know this one. But if you're from Spain, there's a word that means to, uh, to take or to have. And in Latin America... Um, basically, everywhere outside of Spain, this word is a uh, it's a four letter word that that means something very different. So you can use this same word and it's actually Spanish still, but you use it in context in Spain and Spanish people will look at you like, yes, that, that makes perfect sense. And you use it in Mexico, Argentina, Chile, wherever else. Uh, they're going to look at you like you, you need to watch your manners and go wash your mouth out with soap. So, yes, things are going to be weird when they're translated. You've, um, there's no way around that. You've got to find either good translators. You need to make sure that the messaging that you're using is correct um, and appropriate for the, the uh, audience you're going into. Fat guy in the kitchen. I absolutely agree. My mom always said the three P rule, poor prior planning. If you do that, you'll pretty much guarantee a failure. Yes, exactly. Those who fail to plan are planning to fail. Benjamin Franklin, I think it was. Um, 
but it's amazing what just a little bit of planning will do as well. Like I'm not talking about creating a, a 38 page marketing plan. I'm talking about like one page, like writing down what I'm doing, who I'm doing it for, why I'm doing it, where are they? What matters? What doesn't? In fact, if you've not grabbed this one yet, this will help you uh, walk through those. I call it my marketing master plan. Actually, fun fact. I don't know if you guys have checked out the um, uh, podcast interview that I did with Social Media Examiner. It's on their YouTube channel as well. Uh, basically, just go to Social Media Examiner's YouTube channel. Uh, look at the latest episode. It was me and Mike talking about the marketing master plan where I walk through all of these steps, the the model, the market, the message, the media, the machine in, uh, in explicit detail. So go watch that and uh, tag me in the comments and I'll hop over and we'll say hi and we'll have a conversation in social media examiners comment thread. It'll be fun. Okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. B dot bags. Oh, thank you, Adam. You're a great teacher. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. I'm glad you're finding this useful. Habiba, do you have any recommended books for creating a successful business plan? Yeah, I do. Look at um, stuff by Strategizer. I, this isn't necessarily going to give you like the formal business plan. I mean, honestly, like anything on Amazon, I haven't done like a quote unquote business plan forever simply because. I normally come in after the business plan is made. Let me see if I can refresh my memory on any that I really like. Yeah, here's the one. Here's the one that I refer to time and time again. It's called Business Model Generation uh, by Strategizer. So if you just type in Business Model Generation, a handbook for visionaries, game changers, and challengers, I've got a couple copies hanging around. Actually, one over there and one somewhere buried in the back. Good book. Important book. All right. Where are we? Jeff, my spelling sucked today. All good. Don't text and walk, people. Yeah, stay safe out there. Watch where you're going. <coughs> Bruce from Denver. Hey, Bruce, good to see you. Sitting here on the couch with my new baby boy. Hey, congratulations. Exciting times. Never too early to get him started with his own personal brand. Yeah, honestly, dude, if you've not bought his name, uh, .com, sometimes they're not available. If you have like a really common name like davesmith.com. I actually know a Dave Smith. Super cool guy. Really love Dave. But like, it's funny because uh, he, I've used him as a testimonial in the past. And I was like, dude, your testimonial looks fake because it's from Dave Smith, which sounds like a made up name. But anyways, I digress. Uh, go get his domain name.com. If you need to use his middle name in there as well, or middle initial, don't be afraid to do that. It's like 10 bucks a year, et cetera, et cetera. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, let me see. Ludwig, how was your approach staying ahead of the curve in the ever-evolving world of digital marketing, ensuring that your agency remained relevant and competitive? <clears throat> okay, so I think there's two, there's two different questions here. The first of which is, how do you stay ahead of the curve? The second question is, how do you make sure that your agencies stay relevant and competitive? Those are not the same thing. And the reason is, is because in order to maintain relevancy and competitiveness, you often don't need to be on the cutting, bleeding edge of things. In fact, normally you don't. One of the keys to my success has been to be a relatively slow adopter, especially when it comes to anything that I'm doing for clients. In other words, I'll never go into a new platform, a new strategy, a new tactic, a new hack, unless it's been proven. And then my intention is to go in and become the leader in that space. But I want it to prove itself first before I invest time and money and energy into something that may or may not work out. There's a ton of social media platforms that you've never even heard of that a lot of people jumped on and went really, really big on that were just not great strategies or they didn't pan out for long. So that's how I make sure that all of agency work and client work and things like that is I'm sticking to fundamentals, to proven marketing principles. I'm using platforms that I know they've been vetted. We've gotten good results. We continue to get good results. Like all of that is set. Now me personally, yeah, I, I, I want to be as relevant and I want to know about all the trends and the tips and the hacks and everything that I can. Um, my strategy for where to get information has changed over the years. It used to be heavily reliant on podcasts and Google searches, marketing trends, marketing tips, new marketing stuff. What I found is that a lot of the, especially the Google related articles have become kind of rehashed, reused articles. That's kind of just using old stuff. So YouTube, honestly, huge right now. Like there's so much good stuff here. So many new, amazing, um, new marketers coming onto the scene, making more marketing related content that are, are pushing into different niches and things like that. 
TikTok ads, Instagram content. So I'll, I'll watch a bunch of different things there. Um, also, I've got a really good network. So that's something that I've built up over years uh, with really good friends and really good colleagues. And they'll send me a message wherever my phone is. Um, and they'll be like, dude, you hear about this? Check this out. And so they, they know right away. I'll know right away. I'll send it to them. But that that's really it. I appreciate that is not replicable at this point if you don't have that network. So yeah, YouTube, stay here. Watch the channel. Watch other channels. Look at stuff. Uh, teacher Abel, how do I build trust? Good question. How do you build trust? You build trust by saying what you're going to do, doing that, showing up repeatedly, consistently, time and time again, providing more value than you take in return. That's kind of it in a nutshell. If you go into a relationship and this, like everything you do in marketing and business is a relationship with you and your potential customers, your audience, et cetera. If you go into that with the mindset and the intention of helping someone as much as you possibly can, you will build trust. Marketing is interesting because you can't, Thanks to video, thanks to how savvy and sophisticated people are, you can't really fool people anymore. It's like you used to see those like sleazy snake oil salesmen on the late night infomercials and they're like, change your life for $29.95 and but buy now and get this. And, and they'd be really slick and smooth um, and they could snow a lot of people. It's harder now, thankfully. So people can tell. And energy, this is going to get a little woo-woo here for a second, but like Communication is a bit of a transfer of energy. So right now, you can tell, hopefully, that what I'm telling you is honest and authentic and ethical, and it's from my personal experiences. Like, this is me sharing what I believe is true, and I genuinely believe it, and I think you can tell. On the other hand, if I was kind of like, all right, well, here, try this, and that might work, and here, buy this thing, and etc. Like, you're going to pick up on that really quickly, and it'll damage the trust you have. So the takeaway, the, the earlier answers I gave you still stand, but the takeaway really is intention and the frame and the mindset that you're going into any relationship with. And and we know people are good at, at finding people to trust more often than not. So Arvind, you are creating so much value. <clears throat> you should have millions more subscribers. Keep up the good work. Well, I appreciate the kind words, my friend. We'll see. We might get there one day. Uh, we're also in marketing, which is a slightly more niched than... Um, than bigger, broader topics, but I'm happy with everyone that's here. So I got no complaints. Jennifer Walters, how important do you think AI like a chatbot is for a website? Oh, good question. So two different questions here, I think. Jennifer is how important do I think AI is? And then how important do I think AI is for something like a website? So first of all, fun fact, AI, artificial intelligence, has been with us for a long time. We just haven't seen it in the way that it's currently being presented through things like ChatGPT, where it's being presented as conversational tools that make it look like we're actually talking to a human. But like almost everything is, is using some kind of artificial intelligence in order to predict user behavior, to personalize things, um, to show different search results in the search engines. Um, YouTube has different suggested AI for which videos appear on the, the homepage, which ones show up in search. Like all of this stuff is not new. Uh, it's better and it's getting significantly better at, a, at an alarming pace, which I think is phenomenally exciting, but like another topic for another day. How important do I think it is for a website? Eh, a chatbot's helpful. I won't like. I won't argue. It's it's good to have if you can have it. But take a look at what you want your website to do. Is it collect leads? Is it make sales? Is it get them to consume content? And then make sure that everything you're doing on your website is geared towards that one goal. And if a chatbot is going to help facilitate the achievement of that goal, then do that. And if it's not, then don't do that. All right. My name is Landon, but most call me Lando after Star Wars. Lando. I like it. I'm going to try and remember that. Lando Calrissian, if I remember right. So Lando, I'm going to I'm going to try and burn that into my brain. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, wow, a lot of book questions. And that's, that's exactly what I was looking for today. Oh, amazing. I've got another thing. Hang on. If everyone's looking for books, first of all, it's a good cue that I need to make another uh, video on books. The second thing is I might even have another one. This one is a bit older. I'm going to put a link in the chat at the very, very bottom. Um, it's to a Excel spreadsheet that's um, a list of some of my favorite books that you can go take a look at. I think, like I said, I haven't updated that in a year, but like like all good books, um, they're still relevant and valuable today. So 
Take a look at the ones I've recommended first on YouTube because they'll be more new and relevant. If you're still looking for stuff, go check out this list. I think I've broken it down. Do 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 do. Elnaz, what is the best way to learn Instagram's algorithms? Yeah, what is the best way to learn an algorithm? Two ways. Um, trial and error is one of the best ways by like literally posting things and seeing what works for you and what doesn't. Uh, the second thing is to take a look at the different reports by Sprout Social, Hootsuite, Buffer, Metricool, HubSpot. All of them put out social media marketing trends reports and they show lives are getting pushed, reels are getting pushed, this is working, that's working. Um, YouTube is really good for the latest and greatest things on that, like what's hot with the algorithm right now. Uh, what else is there? Um, top accounts. Yeah, Teacher Abel says this. That's another one that I don't mind, but you've got to be careful with that one. So study the content that is getting viewed. So yes, look at other accounts that are getting decent results, but be careful with that because what works for them may not work for you. And it also might be different depending on what stage you're at in your journey. For example, if you were starting a YouTube channel today from scratch, I would not do the kind of videos that I'm doing. Um, because I've been doing it for, I don't even know, six plus years or 600, 700 videos on it. Like it's a, it's a different style and tone and framing. What I would probably do is niche specific search based videos. Uh, then I would work up to some suggested content and so on and so forth. So it's be careful when you're looking at like more established creators and modeling your strategy after them. Uh, cause what they did to get where they are is probably very different than what they're doing now. Corporal Diesel, the coffin could be exasperated by the change in humidity from Hawaii to your hometown. Yeah, probably. Also, the trade winds really help keep the air quality high on the islands. Yeah, you're not kidding. Oh, man. That's right. You were you were in Iwa Beach for a while. Yeah, I miss. Oh, I miss. I miss the warmth already. It's so cold here. We got home and um, everybody's like freezing and in sweaters. It's actually, I don't want to say it's funny, but it's like, yeah, we're all freezing. Uh, Jerry, I use QR as a way to ask for testimonial or reviews for Google. Put them on emails. Yeah. I think that's fine. There's a lot of ways to use them. Uh, teacher Abel, give a thumbs up to Adam. Thanks a ton. Hey, yes. Let's, uh, we'll boost the algorithm. We'll get, we'll get those thumbs up going. Thank you, my friend. <clears throat> Rahul, what's that? Marketing tools you know, Adam? Not, <coughs> it's funny now that we think about coughing. We'll get some water. None that I love, um, personally, honestly. Like, all of the tools when it comes to social media, like, it changes really quick especially with WhatsApp, I don't have any that I'm like super fond of. So you can Google them and test them and see what works best. In fact, there's not many tools that I love for, um, for social. I've been playing around with different like Instagram tools. I've been looking at, uh, I've got a accounts with a bunch of them. Planoly, Later, Metricool. Metricool is probably still my favorite one for that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're tricky and they change a lot. Leveraging chat GPT for idea and productivity. Have you been trying? If so, what prompts have you found to be useful, especially for marketers? So yeah, so I've got the, um, I, I splurged the 20 bucks a month for the chat GPT plus or whatever it is, which gives me access to slightly more chat GPT for technologies. Uh, and it's, it's been very cool. I've been using it a lot. I've found, I bought a bunch of prompts. So I bought some like in a course, I didn't like them. I looked up some super prompts that I watched a video on someone that's like, this is the greatest prompt ever. And that I didn't like it. It's like, there's a lot of things that I found that I just did not like. In fact, for me, the best prompts so far have been being explicitly clear with chat GPT about what I want. For example, write me a Facebook ad to sell kitten mittens, make it conversational, but also kind of funny. Um, include the benefits that kitten mittens will keep your kitten's feet warm in the snow and, um, tell a story about my best testimonial, which came from Karen from Idaho, who said, my cat's feet are happier than ever post. And then it'll write something and I'll be like, that's, that's actually pretty good. And I'll be like, write this again, but make it shorter post, write this again, but make it funnier post, write this again, but with less emojis analyze, like whatever it is. So I found that I give it what I can and then I, I adapt and modify it from there. I'm also not selling kitten mittens. Please don't ask. No more kitten mittens. Fun fact, our neighbor's cat in Hawaii, like their cats, they clued in that I was the only one awake at like four in the morning. So they were outside of my door every single morning. 
they became my friends. I'm not really a cat guy. I, I like my dog, but um, I became a cat guy because they were my only pets there. And they would just like, they'd walk right in and sit beside me and uh, miss my neighbor cats. Okay. Cap. Bovating. Your marketing vids are so informative and remarkable. Keep it up. Yes. Remarkable. That's it. The purple cow. Thank you, my friend. Well, I appreciate the kind words. And yes, that's what it's about. In fact, do I even have it? Of course, I don't beside me now. I've got so many copies of Seth Godin's purple cow book um, beside me. It's probably not my favorite book of his. Like this is marketing by Seth Godin. One of the best books you can read. Go read that one, actually, for anyone interested in books. This is marketing by Seth Godin. Uh, basically, everything Seth Godin has written is worth reading. Um, but yeah, Purple Cow, it's all about being remarkable. I like it. Okay, Immaculate Heart. Hey, my friend, good to see you here. I attended AdWorld Conference. It was fire, but now I have so many ideas from that. You and others that I'm overwhelmed and don't know what to focus on as a digital marketer biz. Ideas to focus. I love it. So, where do you focus? First of all, Understand that the desire to do all of the things all at once is not unique. That is something that I struggle with on a daily basis. I, I get so amped up about all of this stuff. I do not have enough time in the day to do all of the things that I want to do in one area of marketing, much less business, much less life. So we have to be selective. We have to prioritize the things that are actually going to matter. I do have videos on this. Um, there's a couple, if you look up the one, I can't remember. I think it's like how to simplify your life. Look at that video. That's going to help you because it's going to talk about prioritization and simplification. Yeah, how to simplify your life. I've got one called How to Simplify Your Business. Maybe watch that one after. Watch How to Simplify Your Life First. It's the thumbnail right now. I think it says less is more. Do 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 do. Felipe, click funnels with AI. Do you recommend Love from Santiago, Chile? Yes, I think it's fine. Um, I prefer. Where's my link again? How do I pull these things up? There we go. I prefer this one. So I've never been a huge ClickFunnels fan. I uh, I don't mind it. It's fine. A lot of friends, clients, everyone uses it. Um, I've always preferred lead pages over ClickFunnels, and now I prefer high level over all of those, mostly for the integrations. So I like the designs that I can make with, say, lead pages or ClickFunnels. I'd make it with ClickFunnels. I think you can then import it directly into high level, like literally copy paste your ClickFunnels funnel into high level, but then you get better integrations with SMS and email. So that is my preference. Let's see. Hannah, how do you change someone who has a strong anchoring bias? You don't. That's the beauty of anchoring. Ah, great. Such a good question. How do you change someone that has a strong anchoring bias? Maybe they've seen a price that something costs $1 and now you're selling something for $1,000 and they're like, nope, that's worth a dollar. How do you change their mind? It's going to be tough. Uh, that is literally why we call it anchoring bias. It can be done. You can present information. You can um, you can overcome objections. You can whatever it is. The best way to do it is to position it a, as a completely new thing. So that thing is a dollar. Your thing's a thousand hypothetical numbers, but they're not even the same thing. Apples to oranges, not apples to apples. So if they're selling, I don't know, soap, you're not selling soap. You're selling a body cleansing solution. You're selling hygiene in a bar. You're selling, like whatever it is, it needs to be positioned completely different so that they don't associate that as the same thing, just a thousand times more expensive. The other thing you can do, and this is my preference, is to just leave those people alone and go somewhere else. Uh, we don't need to sell to everyone. We can't. So I find the, if like someone's already set in their ways, I don't, I don't preach to them. Ludwig, what would be your marketing agency dream team? Ooh, that's a cool question. I like it. Who would be my marketing agency dream team? So I would have, um, I probably have Seth Godin as my CMO, my chief marketing, marketing officer, his, for his vision and his strategy and his, um, and his ethics and his morality and his vision on marketing, like all of that in there. I like, I like him there. I would probably have, uh, Eugene Schwartz in charge of copywriting, loves copywriting. I'd have David Ogilvy team up with Eugene Schwartz in order to create advertisements. I would have, who would I have for video? Oh, there's so many good video people. You know, whose stuff I really like right now is Ed from Film Booth. I love every video that Ed makes. If you haven't subscribed to Film Booth's channel, I'm actually going to do a bit of a collab, collaboration with Ed here soon. Um, <clears throat> he's got a new channel as well called Creator Booth. So look up Film Booth or Creator Booth. Say that Adam sent you. Say hi. Um, I really like his stuff, like his, his editing style, his storytelling. It's really quite good. 
what else would I do? Social media, hard to say. I like my me. I'd, I'd maybe stay in charge of that for my own videos and content. For direct response marketing, maybe direct mail, I'd have Dan Kennedy um, to help out with some of the business strategy. I'd probably have Jay Abraham in order to carve out new areas um, of business and opportunity. For efficiency, maximization, making sure like maybe, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say my CTO, but like my CTO, CFO, CMO, I'd probably put uh, Perry Marshall in there. I did an interview with him many, many years ago back, I think in like 2018 on 8020 marketing. It was a hugely profound um, shift in the way that I look at business and marketing. So that should help. Uh, Deborah Perrine, what are your thoughts on emailing monthly newsletters? I like it. I think it's amazing. I would do more than monthly though. Um, I do weekly. Depend Again, I talked about this right at the beginning of this live, but monthly email newsletters are phenomenal. They're kind of the like start there at the very least, but that like we need more than that because Again, let's just run the math here. If you have an average open rate of like say 30%, it's probably around 20%, I think for most people, but like say 30% and you send one a month, well, that means it could be like three months have passed before somebody has seen your email and actually opened and read it, which means they've completely forgot about you. Okay, let me see. I've got time for one more question and then family time. And laundry and and packing, unpacking and grocery shopping and all the all the things that come with being home. Rarts, hey there, Adam. Hope you're having a good day. I am, my friend. Thank you. I seem to struggle with my team as I'm a really chill guy, so people start lacking in their work as they get too comfy. How to change my approach? Yeah, this is a good question. So what do you do? First of all, I'm not a chill guy, but I'm a really nice guy. So I'm certainly never chill, but I'm I'm more of a people pleaser that I, I never want to hurt people. I never want to like provide too much constructive criticism. That said, it's a muscle that can and must be learned. You've got to be a leader in the role where you're making sure that people are living up to their capacity, fulfilling their potential within the role or company that you're doing, setting expectations appropriately, obviously, but like you'd be surprised what just a quick check-in and conversation will do. How are things going? How are you doing? Anything I can help you with? If they miss a deadline, hey, I noticed you missed this deadline. What happened? How can I help you so it doesn't happen again? You may have to set reminders for yourself to do these check-ins, but like, yeah, you've, you've got to hold people accountable to the work that they're doing or your business will not succeed. It's, um, it's sad, but I've had to, over my career, let people go. Um, like uh, quite a few over the years. I've had some that have been with me forever, but I've had some people that just literally, I, I could not help them enough. I couldn't be like, what about this? What about that? Why are you missing this? What else can I do to help you? And they would still miss it. And I'd be like, Hey, I gotta be honest with you. This isn't working. D do you see any solutions? They're like, well, I could try harder. I'm like, cool, let's try that for two more weeks. And then they still let it go. And it's like, all right, I think, I think we should find you something else. Cause it's, it's not panning out here. So yeah, those, um, those things will happen. Communication. That's the secret. All right. I think I've got one more. Do, do, do. Oh, there we go. The podcast interview was great. Yeah, the social media examiner one with um, Michael Stelzner. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I love Mike. He's such an awesome guy. He's really good at uh, at like having conversations and like getting good information out of people. Really good. So yeah, if you haven't listened to that social media examiner, go check out their podcast on YouTube and um, listen to that interview. All right, final question for the day: What is a good framework for social media marketing that would be universally applicable? This is going to tie in perfectly with what I just said. It is this one, the marketing master plan. You can get it here, um, freemarketingcheatsheet.com. You can also get the full breakdown just by listening to that podcast interview with Michael uh, Stelzner on um, Social Media Examiner's podcast on the YouTube channel. Also, I'll break it down for you right now. And the reason that this one is universally applicable is because it has stood the test of time. It has been revised over, over a decade now. I've used this with billion dollar companies, with solopreneurs, with startups, with everything in between, and it always works. And the reason it always works is because it's built on fundamental principles. So we start with the model. What is your business model? Meaning, what are you selling? What is the margins around it? What are the pricing? What is the packaging? What is the, what is the entire structure of your business look like? Are you doing too many different things? Probably. Should you focus in on one specific area where you're going to make the most amount of money and help the most amount of people? Yes. Like all of those things become clear when you focus in on that. Then we go to market. Number two, 
who is the ideal target market? What are their age, gender, income, occupation, their geographic details, city, state, province, country they live in, etc.? Psychographic details. What are their values, their attitudes, their beliefs, their organizations, their affiliations, all of the things that they're associated with you need to get clear on. Then we move on to message. What are their pains, their miseries, their, their fears, their frustrations, all of the problems that they're going through right now? And what are their miracles, their wants, their dreams, their goals, their desires, all the things that they want to get to? Your business's goal with your message is to bridge that gap, move them away from their current present location right now that sucks, is terrible, they want to they get away from this problem, towards the holy land, the promised land, the good life, the, the thing that they want. And the better you're able to understand what both of these are and the better you're able to communicate your business as the solution, the better you're going to do. Number three, four, I don't even know what we're up to. Three, yeah, what do we got? We got model, market, message, media, four. Um, media, where are they present and active online? You do not need to do everything. You do not need to be everywhere. Whoever said that is, um, has too much time and money on their hands. It's like you can be focused and selective on where your best customers are spending their time. Go there, interact with them there, ignore everything else. I don't care how cool or trendy or popular it is. If your people aren't there, you're wasting your time. Then machine. What is the customer journey? What is the marketing funnel? What is the sales funnel? What is the process that you're going to walk someone through from having no idea who you are all the way through to becoming a loyal customer who loves you, loves what you do, wants to tell everyone about just how great you are? For example, you could start with traffic, some kind of organic paid traffic, doesn't really matter. Uh, let's use Facebook as an example. You could make a Facebook post. You could do a Facebook live. You could make a Facebook reel. You could run a Facebook ad. All of those can then guide someone to the next stage in your funnel. Maybe it's content, a blog post, a video, a podcast. Maybe it's a lead magnet, something that they're going to download in exchange for their name and or email address. What comes after that? Are you going to follow up with email marketing? Are you going to do SMS? Are you going to send them direct mail if you capture their uh, physical mailing address? All of these need to be taken into consideration. Then, what does your sales process look like? What's your conversion mechanism? Are you doing a sales call? Do you have a sales page? Do you have a sales team? Do you collect orders over the phone? Do you do it via social media? Like, are you selling through Amazon? Like, whatever it is, you need to figure that out. And then after that, we can talk about retention, upsells, downsells, cross-sells, loyalty, referral programs. All of this doesn't necessarily need to be completely dialed in the moment you launch, but it's all something that needs to be considered and built over time. This is the foundation of every successful business. They have all of these pieces and it will work whether we're talking about YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, direct mail, banners, skywriting, carrier pigeons, smoke signals, whatever it is, this will work and it will continue to work for decades if not centuries to come. So with that said, my friends, thank you for being here today. Thank you for the great questions. Keep them coming. Uh, if you want to put some more here, put them in the comment section below. I've got that new channel coming very soon. Videos are, are being prepped for it right now. And I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that I don't get a chance to live on that channel. So with that said, I'll see you, uh, I'll see you soon. Have a great week, everyone.